mother's womb. So in other words, I see evolution in the same way I see development in the womb as an ordained, sustained, and natural process, no God of the gaps. And I am not philosophically opposed to the God of the gaps, just that I don't see these gaps in nature. Second, what about intelligent design? Well, I believe in intelligent design, and back to Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I might add, I have double the design argument of the anti-evolutionists. We'll agree on complexity and functionality and beauty and the static operations of the world, but I extend that to the evolutionary side. I mean, we heard it just in the lecture previously with regards to cosmology. I think there's an argument starting with regards to evolutionary biology and, of course, the issue of the image of God and human sin, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. I believe they're utterly real and they're mysteriously manifested. And I don't take out the M card because I'm in trouble. I take it out because I think this is truly a mystery in terms of how the image is manifested, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay, biblical hermeneutics, and I have to give you, and I think personal story is pretty important. What's the University of Toronto Med School all about? This is, this is my holiest place. This is my mecca in the world. When I'm in Toronto, I always go down to these steps because I made the biggest decision in my life. I walked out of med school after three days to become a creation scientist. So was I committed to a very literalistic, anti-evolutionary view? You bet. And here's my diary. Going on to theology school, registration day, Regent College, UBC, August 30th. The grand plan? To declare absolute and pure hell on the theory. The reason I'm saying this and presenting this is I want you to know where I was to where I've come from. And what happened at Regent College? Well, I walked in with the following assumption. You have this definition in your notes. I, and I like qualifying it the term scientific concordism, it is the assumption, and not many people are aware of this assumption, they just take it, and we, we, we pick it up in our church as the assumption that God reveals scientific and facts in the Bible thousands of, year, thousands of years before the discovery by modern science. This is very reasonable. God is the creator of his works. God is the author of his word. It is reasonable to suggest that the two align. But here's the question, and this is what shook me up when I was at Regent College. But is it true? It doesn't undermine the Word of God. It undermines an assumption we have of the Word of God. And on your handout, this is what started deconstructing me. Have you ever noticed in the Scriptures what we actually have with regards to the structure of the world? is a three-tier type universe. You don't have to go very far into the, into the Scripture. And we had Paul Seeley give an excellent presentation yesterday afternoon. Second day of creation, God created a rakia, and that's exactly what the word means in Hebrew, a hard for its surface to lift the waters above from waters below. And of course, we sit there and go, that doesn't make any sense. You know that song, dance like an Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian, think like an Egyptian, put yourself in the ancient Near East, that big blue dome above you, not a bad idea. It says there's water up there, it occasionally spits at you. Again, not a bad idea. Sun, moon, and stars are placed in it. Isn't that what it looks like? So what did I start seeing? I saw an ancient phenomenological perspective of the world. Not to be confused with our modern phenomenological perspective. We know that's the scattering of blue light at the, at the, at the blue end of the, the spectrum. So what we have to do is think like them. And so what they saw, they believed is real. In other words, this is the best science of the day being used as a vessel by the Holy Spirit to get across the point we are a creation. It is an ancient science. And to give you some evidence with regards to that, and just to set, I'm just not this liberal on the loose, this comes, take a look at that picture. That's the Shamash plaque. And if you probably noticed in the, in the book display, uh, this picture on John Walton from Wheaton, uh, who put that right in the cover. I mean, John was doing a polemical move to say there is a three-tier universe up there. And so what you see with the Shamash plaque, yeah, this is the sun god of the Mesopotamians, but notice the structures there. There's your waters above, there's your firmament, and there's your heavenly bodies. Go over to the Egyptians, we see the very same sort of thing. From their perspective, makes perfect sense. Separate away the theology, but you're going to see there's your water, there's your firmament, there's your stars, in the firm, there's the sun god Ray in his boat going across the waters. Now, if you notice in that little handout, we're sort of, uh, and Paul said it so well yesterday, that there's a Frisbee. You know, the Earth is sort of like a Frisbee. And we actually have a world map from uh, uh, the 6th century BC in which you have a circumferential sea all the way around the, uh, the Babylonian world. And they talk about Babylon being at the belly button or the navel of the world. And you sort of say, what do you make of this with water all around? Think 
like an Egyptian. Think like a Mesopotamian. You're in Babylon. People are traveling about. What are they hitting? Water. Not such a bad idea. Now think about the scriptures in Isaiah 41. The calling of Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, which was at the ends of the earth makes perfect sense. Or think about the Queen of Sheba being called to, uh, going to uh, visit Solomon, where Jesus says she came from the ends of the earth to, to meet Solomon. So the ancient science is being there, and it's fairly clear. What about Genesis 1? I think it's a magnificent piece of literature inspired by the Holy Spirit, but you see this deep structure here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was, and here's the Hebrew, tohu bohu. Not much rhyming scheme in Hebrew, but this catches us. And this tohu bohu, this formless and empty, is being, is being used as a device to line up the parallel panels. So you'll notice on your first three days, you're solving the darkness problem, separation of light from darkness. Now, if you understand the firmament, this makes sense. Separation of the waters above from waters below, and then separation of water from dry land. Now, look at how this aligns. This is brilliant. You got light on day one, luminaries on day three. With regard to day five, biologists, what's the taxonomical connection between flying creatures and sea creatures? There is none, but there's a literary one. You got an empty space, you got a water area, and finally, us. Question, scientific and courtism? I can't go there anymore. Well, what am I going to do? I use a principle called the message incident principle to separate the divine theology from the incidental ancient science. So there's an ancient science, and it's not a mistake. The Holy, when the Holy Spirit met you, did he not come down to your level when you encountered Christ? So too in the revelatory process. So let's take a passage from Philippians, you know, uh, the canonical passage. At the name of uh, Jesus, the Jesus is Lord. I think everyone can pick that up in terms of the divine message. But Jesus is Lord where? In heaven, on earth, and you got it. And not just under the earth. It's the chthonic realm, catechthonios, the underworld. So what you're seeing here is the three-tiered universe. We separate the message away. That's where Paul was at from which we can go ahead. And, and, and I submit, you don't need all this hermeneutical fancy stuff to encounter Jesus. I mean, I didn't see any of this as a young earth creationist, but did I get Jesus as Lord? Absolutely. That's the proficiency and sufficiency of the text. So with regards to astronomy, if you haven't read the letter to Christina by Galileo, I mean, this is a brilliant astronomer, but his hermeneutics are just amazing. Right? So the intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach us how one goes to heaven and not how heaven goes. We can co-opt that to the evolution discussion today. The intention of the Bible is to teach us that God is the creator, not how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created. So, message incident principle. I think it's easy to see the messages. God in Genesis 1 to 3 is a creation. The world's very good. We're creating the image of God. We're sinners. God judges sin. But with regards to the creation of the world, it is quick and complete. It is de novo creation. It is the best science of the day. So we'll separate and not conflate the two. Here's one of my heroes. <clears throat> the Bible is not a book of science. That kind of shook me up when I heard that. The Bible is a book of redemption. And, of course, I believe the creation story. I believe that God did create the universe. I believe that God created humanity. And I don't know if anyone's ever seen this before. Whether it came by an evolutionary process... And at a certain point, he took this person to being and made him a living soul or not. I love Graham. He's not going to overstep his, his, his academic competency. does not change the fact that God did create humanity. Whichever way God did it makes no difference as to what men and women are. You know he believes we're creating the image of God and we're sinful. And the relationship to God restored through Christ. Who does a better job of preaching this? All right. Human origins, the tough issue. In your handout... It is clear that I don't embrace a disteleological Richard Dawkins understanding of evolution that is atheistic, driven by blind chance, and we're nothing but animals controlled by physical instincts. I'm an evolutionary creationist. I believe human origins is ordained and sustained by God. We're created in the image of God, fallen into sin, and these are non-negotiable. I won't even discuss it. This is where I start. However, big question, how and when? And that's a tough question. Let's go back to the womb. Wonderful parallels to be done in the womb. Question, when did you start bearing the image of God? And I'm going to do this just for the fun of it. Did you get half an image from the sperm cell and half an image from the egg? Did you get half a sin from mom and half a sin from dad? Or did you get the whole sin from dad and no sins from mom? I mean, that's one way of looking at it. My mom's a saint. <laughs> Was it a punctiliar event, punctus in Latin, at a point? Did it come thundering in at fertilization? You know, it is two-cell stage, 
first heartbeat, brain activity, whatever stage you want. Or is it possible that it's very, very real, but we really can't find a point, but through a mysterious, and I mean mysterious in its fullest sense, we don't have the, we don't have the epistemological apparatus to fully grasp it, a mysterious and gradual manifestation. Well, with that being the case, let's try this on the human evolution account. Remember, we don't evolve from chimps. I mean, the moment I hear a Christian saying we evolve from chimps or monkeys, I know this person has not done the science. We descend from a common ancestor about six million, uh, six million years ago. Doesn't bear the image, is not sinful. 